Well, good morning. Um, it's with great pleasure um, we're having this panel here, and uh, we have an amazing group of people who walk different parts of life. But one thing they have in common is they all are interested and in very devote their lives to help food security, food resilience, crop resilience, however you want to call it. So it was it's great to have all here, and I'd like to introduce one by one, starting with Dr. Wayne Parrott, Professor of the Crop and Soil Science Department at UGA, and he is nothing less than fellow of the American Association of the Advancement, Advancement of Science and the GMO Bureau. Uh, we have Dr. George Mbata. He is the Chair and Professor of Biology at Fort Valley State University, a land-grant university in Beach County, Georgia. Um, we have Representative Sanford Bishop, uh, who is Chairman of the Agriculture Appropriation Subcommittee. We have Dr. Scott Engel, who is now Director of the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture, who used to be our Dean at the College of Agriculture at UGA. Um, we have Representative Scott, Austin Scott, member of the Agriculture Committee and the leading sponsor of the Global Food Security Act. And finally, we have Dr. Dave Poisington, who is the director for the Feed the Future Peanut Innovation Lab, which is University of Georgia and USDA partnership to fight old hunger. So um, I'd like each of you to please introduce yourselves. With you. I guess, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, name is... Uh, Wayne Parrott. Uh, I've been on campus in crop and soil sciences for about 30 years now. And uh, do you want to say briefly what you do? Yeah, I, uh, when you walked into this room, you saw this wonderful banner on uh, plant breeding at UGA. So uh, I work within the Institute of Plant Breeding, Genetics, and Genomics. Uh, very proud of that program. And uh, within that, I'm in the the trait development, I uh, use both conventional and biotech approaches to get useful traits into crops. My name is uh, George Mbata, I'm Department Chair of Biology for the Valley State University. But by, by training, I'm an entomologist and I, I work a lot with the College of Agriculture. Um, I have uh, really been participating in international programs funded by USAID since uh, 2001. I was with the uh, IPM CRISP, Integrated Pest Management uh, Collaborative Support Research Program, East Africa, and, uh, and also with West Africa between 2001 and uh, 2012. Uh, currently, I, I work with the uh, Post Harvest Innovation Lab in Ghana. And, uh, what we do is to seek for ways to protect the maize crop. Yeah, so my relevance here is that I'm an entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Congressman Sanford Bishop. I represent the second Congressional District of Georgia. Uh, I am in my 27th year in uh, the U.S. House of Representatives. I've served on the agriculture uh, authorization authorizing committee. I now chair the uh, agriculture subcommittee of uh, the appropriations committee. That's uh, funding agriculture, rural development, and uh, the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, I have a passion for rural America. I also have a passion for our international programs. Uh, foreign agriculture is very important. It's a very diplomatic tool, and I appreciate very much uh, uh, this summit and look forward to continuing to work with all of you to improve the quality of life uh, for people on this planet uh, for years to come. Thank you. My name is Scott Engel. I'm a soil scientist by training, a uh, microbial ecologist to be more specific. Uh, last couple of years I have spent primarily in Africa and Asia um, helping farmers to appropriately <coughs> utilize fertilizers and plant nutrients. For about a year now, I've been the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. This along with our partners in the Agricultural Research Service, which is led by my friend Siobhan Jacobs-Young, uh, the two of us provide uh, 
funds appropriated by Congress to the land-grant universities as well as ARS scientists around the country, and that accounts for the large bulk of publicly funded federal research in the country. So Dr. Jacobs Young and myself, our job is to make sure that those funds appropriated by Congress are solving important problems, are being used efficiently, and we are telling our stories to the American public so that they understand the importance of research and how it can change lives. My name is Austin Scott. I am uh, from Tifton, Georgia. And Zippy, I didn't know the kids had a choice. Uh, when, when I was 18, I, I uh, uh, but I am in Congress now in my ninth uh, year. I spent 14 years at the state legislature where I also served on the uh, House Ag Committee while I was in the state legislature. And I'm Dave Hoisington. I'm a research professor here at the University of Georgia and also the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Peanuts. My training is, is really in genetics and, and corn pathology uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and I got started in some of the earlier days of using some of the modern genomics technologies to understand genetics of crops. I was able to spend almost 25 years uh, working in international agriculture at two of the CGIR institutes, CEMIT in Mexico and ICRASAT in India, where being at CEMIT, I had the real pleasure of getting to know Norman Borlaug, uh, the founder of the Green Revolution, uh, or one of the co-founders, because I also got the privilege to meet with M.S. Swaminathan when I was in India. Um, for the last six years, I've been here at the University of Georgia, leading the uh, Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Peanut uh, over a course of six years. That project, as has been mentioned, uh, is supported through USAID. Uh, we currently have about 100 scientists and students working in a little over 20 projects involving about 10 universities and USDA colleagues here in the US uh, and a about 15 institutes across uh, 10 countries, primarily in Africa. Well, thank you. So we can see that um, it's a very qualified panel. And uh, I'm sure at the end of this, we will be, we'll know a lot more than what we started with. So I think to begin with, we, I'd like to, one of you to tell us how do you define food resiliency? What's food insecurity and what's food resiliency? Maybe Dr. Presenter? I guess it depends upon how much time we have to talk about that. Uh, it's a big topic. Um, I mean, we've heard a lot about what are the issues around food security and, and insecurity, and, and I think in terms of the fact that we all understand there's going to be tremendous challenges environmentally, physically, et cetera, to, to food security. I think if we look at what's going to create resilience, in my mind and what I've seen in, in my career, it's really having options. And I think that's what's lacking in, in most of the countries that we work in. Whether you're a farmer, you only have one variety, you only have one way of growing the crop, you only have one market opportunity to sell that crop. So if anything happens uh, in almost any aspect of, of in that country, you're going to be affected and then you have nothing to fall back on. And I think we see that in, in everything that we work in, and I think that's one of the things that the innovation labs uh, really are addressing and trying to address, is really create multiple options for those farmers. Um, we have a, in the, in the state of Georgia, we have a Georgia peanut tour that's held every year. And it's a great opportunity to really see what happens in the peanut industry from every aspect from upscale science all the way down to the manufacturing and delivery of peanut-based products globally. We take that opportunity to bring our colleagues over, including farmers from our countries, because we think it's a good opportunity for them to, one, understand that peanuts is business in the state of Georgia and in the United States. But what I find is that it's almost related to what Sippy was talking about. When you take a farmer from Africa and you put them with a farmer in the US, they have the same problems. They're dealing with the same issues. 
But one of the big differences is those farmers in Africa don't have all of the information, the knowledge, or the options that they require. And so I think a lot of what we need to do in, in terms of resilience is actually building that, whether it's new varieties or new production packages, new tools, and new knowledge. Thank you. Um, maybe Dr. Mbato, um, what do you think would be the main reasons or some of the reasons that food resiliency is so fragile in developing countries? And what can we do to help? What do you guys go? <laughs> What is, you know, what we are discussing, uh, resiliency. I, and I would take, look at it as persistency. <laughs> you know, because this, you know, the subsistence, subsistence from us in Africa face these problems every year and they still return to farming. You know, uh, they will experience bad, bad weather, they will also experience poor yields, you know, they will uh, experience interruption of farming maybe due to uh, due to wars and the disturbances, you know, they have a poor storage facilities, you know, they, are, they, are, they have the moments of the, there's the periods of a boost, and then within a short, a short while, everything is gone most of, most of the year, you know, because they can cultivate within a, a, narrow, you know, a, 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 narrow, a narrow time frame. So, they, you know, they keep coming back year after year and continue to do the same thing. And apparently, you know, that's why I said that. we probably will frame it in terms of the resistance, you know, because they are always there and they are attached, you know, to their to their lands. So, you know, there is no running away f uh, from from the land for them. <coughs> so, but what has been done and what I think uh, um, USAID is accomplishing in most places is uh, to at least bring some reward to this by offering some mitigating you know, factors, you know, some intervention, you know, that, that interventions that help them you know, at least preserve their crops, process their crop better. So I think that's the way I look at it. And do you think technology, science technology, would help them solve the problem in some ways? And do you think the United States would help with that? Yeah, I give a, let me give, give an example of the project from the Innovation Lab in Ghana, that's a post-harvest innovation lab. You know, one of the things they didn't have is a storage. Most of the farmers will store their, their crop in their bedrooms, and, you know. Um, so apparently they didn't have a, a lot of a protection. So what we did there was look for ways, first of all, you know, put in a drying method that is not too expensive. You know, like uh, we, we build a solar hybrid dryers. You know, it's just, this is just a tent, you know, with a PVC. Then have uh, shelves underneath it where they can load their crops. And then, you know, with the solar radiation, they're able to dry their crops to safe levels. And we also found that, you know, with that intervention, you know, that Pest infestation be, became reduced, and they can store their crop, their crops, a, a little longer. So, and that is actually we found this particular technology transformative. And what we are trying to do is to move it across the entire West Africa, you know, so that they can adopt that. Uh, another measure also is um, that in Mali, we are. Potatoes, you know, we are stored in, in huts that they are not ventilated. You, what you find out within six weeks, they will lose the entire crop. The USAID came in and build a, you know, um, they build a storage facilities that are not quite big, that with ventilations and fans. So you know, their crops could last three months. And uh, you know, and there you will see the logo of USAID from us to you, and I mean, for me, that was a source of joy that at least some provisions have been made, some assistances have been made to improve people's lives. Very nice, very nice to hear, thank you. Um, one of the things that's also um, good aid and good help um, is the ready to use therapeutic foods. 
And I think um, is in your district, uh, representative Boston Spot, that's a, there's a company that produces it. Um, how do you see the, well, I think peanuts are very important. Uh, how do you see the peanuts? <laughs> Um, in Georgia being produced and helping all peanuts. Peanut, peanuts are very important. I would tell you peanuts probably paid my tuition at the, at the University of Georgia and now I'm sitting here with the doctors that said I would never be on the panel with them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kidding, it was other doctors. Uh, but the, uh, so when we talk about the, the challenges with food in, in the globe, so we, we have issues like um, the doctor was discussing with in Mali and, and how people who are not malnourished but who have challenges with crop storage are. And then we have the, the millions of people around the world who are malnourished who uh, growing a better crop next year is not the challenge. Getting to next year or to next, the next month or, or through the next week is, is the challenge. And that's where... Uh, institutions and companies like MANA, I think, and the NGOs come in where they have actually, it has become uh, that company's mission to develop this product that is uh, high protein, uh, infused with vitamins and, uh, in, and dairy, if I'm not mistaken, so that we're able to provide two packages in one day is enough to to end the malnourishment of an individual child. They're able to do it at an extremely small price. They're able to package it in such a manner that it lasts. Uh, we're able to ship it um, bulk. I mean, they and the NGOs that, that distribute those packages have, have saved millions and millions of people around around the world, the, uh, the one thing that I would suggest, and this actually came from, from General Kelly, with, with any of the packages, packaging like MANA and that we do with USAID, is I do think that the American flag needs to be more prominent on um, the things that we, are, that we are handing out, because the American flag, as you saw in that picture right there, uh, in many of the cases, we're, we're, we're helping people who have a second and third grade literacy rates, or who may be led by people who have third, fourth, fifth grade literacy rates. The American flag is seen as um, as good in, in simple terms around the world, and that, that flag being more prominent on that package, I think, helps uh, the people who are receiving it understand that it is it is it is good and safe and, and for their benefit, and so. Man has done an exceptionally good job. There are other companies that have developed the ready-to-eat uh, thera therapeutic foods as well, but uh, certainly the use of peanuts is, is important to us from an economic standpoint and from the protein standpoint. And uh, there, There's no other food that, that, that you can deliver that much protein to somebody at, at that price. Yeah, that's amazing work. And uh, what's the reach of it? How many countries and who's funding this? Oh, I have uh, uh, Michael Moore. I'm sorry. Moore is his name. Mark Moore. I'm sorry. You're right. I apologize. Mark Moore. Thank you. Uh, and there, I have no idea how many countries. There are 50, 54 countries in Africa. I mean, I, I would say they're in probably the vast majority of probably just in Africa and then when you get into other parts of the world they would be in those countries as well. All over. That's great. Millions, millions of people. Thank you. Well for that we have we need to have the good crops and good peanuts and well not only peanuts, but um, we see that the uh, research on having better crops is essential for that to happen. Um, there's one person here, Doctor um, Wayne Parrot who works with uh, reading of crops and so there's a lot of research that goes on at University of Georgia and um, we see that's a lot of research and there's also within research there's a lot of regulations and policies um, and sometimes they help uh, the distribution and the adoption of these crops sometimes they may hinder it and sometimes they may hinder it in places where they're most needed so um, would you please Expand a bit more on regulations and 
Regulations, okay. Um, let me uh, maybe back up and give a little bit of context information as, you know, as to where I'm coming from. I do come from a farm family. In fact, it was just dawning on me, I'm the first one in, a, in at least 10 generations that has not personally owned a farm. But I like to think I'm still in agriculture. Um, I grew up in the tropics of Central America, uh, had a lot of exposure to everything from large plantations to subsistence farming. Uh, came to college, majored in agronomy, um, and have been, and then went on into uh, plant breeding and genetics. Uh, here on campus, I've, I taught agroecology in the tropics for over a decade, and I have spent, gosh, the uh, last 20 years traveling all over the world helping uh, countries formulate biosafety and uh, regulatory policies on crops. Uh, so I've seen a lot of case studies. And, you know, we talked about the components of resilience, everything from infrastructure to, you know, having the proper storage uh, information. We talked about perhaps not enough having the right management practices, trying to preserve the soil, manage diseases. And the third component being the genetics, uh, which is uh, where we come in. And uh, quite frankly, you know, the success that genetics has had since World War II is just astounding, and I love to tell the story every time. But the bottom line is that we're feeding, uh, you know, what, 8 billion people as opposed to 3 billion people. Uh, and the amount of land and resources is pretty much what it was in World War II. So we have had all those huge gains in efficiency. And uh, part of that is admittedly due to management practices. Part of that is due to um, to the genetics. And depending on whom you ask, half to two-thirds or thereabouts is due to genetics. And so uh, and yields are continuing to increase at about a percent a year. And conventional breeding in this day and age uh, has so much technology. It's got, you know, genomics and in bioinformatics and everything. I have a colleague that says the modern varieties have as much technology in them as, the, as this phone over here does. So uh, conventional breeding then, you know, is going to be, is, has been great at getting uh, more stable yield, more resilience, uh, ability to um, withstand a lot of the uh, environmental stressors that are out there. But what, what is, and some, you know, some traits are really difficult to get. Uh, one of my projects here is insect resistance uh, in soybean particularly. And early on, uh, we took both a biotech approach and a conventional approach. With a biotech approach, we could have had insect resistance in soybeans out in farmers' fields in five years' time. In contrast, the conventional approach, we've been working on that over 20 years, and we expect to release our first variety, insect-resistant variety, with conventional breeding sometime in the next year or two. Just to give you a comparison, uh, that some of the traits are much more difficult with the conventional ones. So this is where the biotech uh, comes in, that extra little piece of biotech that gets you across the finish line and can provide a lot of value-added traits. Uh, herbicide tolerance is a great one. Uh, I have never, ever, ever met a farmer that says, I'm looking forward to getting out and home my field in that hot tropical sun while I swamp mosquitoes and watch out for snakes. Uh, it is probably the single largest sort need for labor, and if they can't provide it, the farmer himself, they'll keep the kids home from school to help with the hoeing, or they might have to hire people. It's a large expense. So a simple trait, such as herbicide tolerance, makes a huge difference, both in, in quality of life and in the expenses on the, for, on, on the farm. And, they, and if they're not hoeing, they can uh, you know, use the time to grow a cash crop that they can sell, or they can get an outside job. I've known people that do that or even spending it with their family is a nice luxury that we often take for granted. So herbicide resistance, we That's show a disconnect between the 
farmers and their perception of the public, because the public is so, always talking about... So we must get rid of this romantic notion that small holder farmers live in perfect harmony with nature. They don't. It is a daily struggle, and they need all the help in the world. And one of my greatest pet peeves are those NGOs that push policies that want to preserve peasant ways of life. You know, all they're doing is condemning them to, you know, you're laughing, but if, if, on the other end of it, it, all you're doing is you're condemning them to a you know, lifetime of hardship and poverty. But along those lines, talking about biotech traits, you know, even in this day and age with all our fungicides, insecticides, and everything that we have, we're still, in the worldwide, we still lose about 30% of our crop to diseases pre-harvest. You know, we don't necessarily need to increase yields. We just need to stop the losses. And with biotech, solving this diseases is low-hanging fruit. It is one of the easiest problems to solve with biotechnology. So we should have the whole country planted with disease-resistant crops, and we don't. And that's where policies uh, start coming into play. Uh, getting in both, so policies in general have delayed the deployment of all biotech crops in general, disease resistance in particular. Uh, and, you know, a lot of them are out of our control. European policy, for example. Uh, some of the trade, you know, uh, anyone that trades with Europe has to sign on to the Cartagena Protocol, which in puts in a lot of restrictions. But uh, closer to home, it's uh, in, in, with one of the points, you didn't bring up the EPA's uh, policy on disease resistance. I can spend 15 years moving a gene from one potato into another, and there would be absolutely no restrictions whatsoever, or I could use biotech to move that exact same gene into potato, take a year, and I would have every single restriction you can imagine, uh, uh, both in Europe and by EPA. So when it comes to disease resistances, uh, the EPA policies towards disease resistance is every bit as unscientific as European and just as restrictive as Europeans are. And it has this ripple effects. I was just uh, in Central America last week, and they were thinking about, you know, with the genome editing that we have now, oh, you know, you've heard there's a disease epidemic affecting the banana crop. It's really easy to solve. Oh, but we could solve it, but then they can't import to the U.S. So, you know, it not only restricts what we do in this country, it restricts what other countries can do. Uh, so... When I see the technology that's coming down the road, I have, I never really worry about feeding the future. We'll, we have the technology that will allow us to meet the needs without using more resources. The only question in my mind is whether we are going to be able to take uh, advantage of this technology or not. Oh, that is very passionate and very informative. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, do you think there is any, no, our representatives here, do you think there is any hope or any vision on how these policies can be changed so that we can help the American farm and then the um, developing country farmers? It's a very, very serious tension, uh, particularly in this country, and of course uh, as we interact with Europe, uh, between um, genetically modified and, and non-genetically modified products. Uh, that's a very, very intense debate which is getting uh, even more complicated uh, as we speak. Um, when you deal with uh, situations as uh, my colleague Austin Scott was describing, where the people cannot worry about the crop next year but have to worry about next week or next month, uh, you really have to put this in perspective and balance, uh, you know, do you want to get into the niceties of uh, avoiding uh, uh, some possible contamination or do you want to uh, give in to, uh, uh, to total uh, uh, food insecurity? And uh, that's, that's a, almost a moral uh, decision 
Uh, and I guess the, the, um, uh, the outcome of that will depend on each and, ev in each and every individual's uh, moral compass uh, who has an opportunity to vote on it in Congress. Uh, I feel very, very strongly that uh, uh, in the biblical admonition that from whom much is given, much is required, we do have the capacity to solve a lot of these problems uh, and to really meet the needs. The question is whether or not uh, we want to be too cute uh, and too perfect and whether we allow the, uh, the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, and when it comes to poverty and life and death situations, uh, which can be improved by uh, uh, the utilization of technology, uh, we might ought to really uh, weigh and carefully consider what the, the best outcome uh, for humanity is going to be. Ma'am, I would, I, I would say, what if we were talking about medicine instead of, instead of uh, agriculture and food? I mean, both are necessities for us. If, if, if the scientists had a way to develop a better medicine, would you want it developed in a year or would you want it developed in 20 years? I mean, it, there's, there's an emotional argument from a, a non -GM, the non-GMO movement and, and other countries that uh, simply are not based on facts. And uh, I, can, I can assure you that if we were talking about medicine, nobody would say we want the development to take 20 years instead of one year when they have a child that is sick. Uh, I would point out and not that I do think that this is an area where uh, foundations uh, like the Gates Foundation can play an, play an important role in educating uh, the public on this. If there's one thing that, that Congress lacks today, it's credibility on a lot of issues. Uh, and, and I do think that the, that the foundations uh, can, can help in, in, in leading us down a fact-based path towards uh, the use of science and technology to develop uh, not just medicine, but, but seeds in a year instead of 20 years. Okay, that's very good with you that um, we, we have the luxury of um, talking about GMOs and technology when, and we have the choice, but some people don't have the choice, right. so they just have to go with it. Um, and Dr. Engel, um, and how do you see NIFA um, helping with, or the United States, uh, helping with food resiliency using all technology that we have available? American farmers need to be at the cutting edge of uh, technology. The margins are so small today that if you're not the best farmer using all of the available technology, you can't make it. But that's not true in many areas of the world. Uh, you can grow 75% of average yields with just a little bit of technology. So we don't need to, we don't need to have auto-driven tractors in many areas of the world. Um, there's lots of simple things that can be done. <clears throat> to um, solve some of these problems. You need good seed genetics, you, you need fertilizers, you need water, you need a good climate. Agriculture ultimately is not that complicated. Uh, Africa particularly is blessed to have many um, varied attributes that will allow her to grow more food, assuming that we can get some relatively simple technologies in place there. Um, the use of GMO crops is, to me, a no-brainer. And I, I would congratulate Dr. Parrott for taking the lead on this. He's been an advocate for this on a global scale for probably decades now, um, and leading some of this, this charge. But I think it's time for Americans to uh, simply stand up and say to the Europeans, we're right and you're wrong. <laughs> and the fact that you are wrong <laughs> is hurting people around the rest of the world, particularly in Africa. There are people who are going hungry because of decisions being made in, uh, in Europe. So we know we have the science on our side. We know we are right. Uh, we need to be proud of the fact that we, that we do have good science that has informed much of this. How can NIFA help? Um, uh, NIFA is charged with uh, supporting American farmers first and foremost. 
Uh, but much of what we do has spin-offs to the rest of the world. I can, there are many, many technologies that have been developed through public investment and research that are being used around the rest of the world, in, including Africa right now. Uh, so we will continue to provide those technologies to American farmers, but we also look for ways that they can be spun off. Because we know that when the, the rest of the world is healthy, has a strong economy, they begin to buy American products at that point. So, uh, yes, we may have invested U.S. taxpayer money in technologies that help another country, but ultimately, as um, Chairman Bishop has said, everyone's boat has floated a little higher, and we will all benefit in the long run from that. Oh, thank you. That's very good. Um, we still have 10 minutes, and I'd like to know if, um, if anyone would have questions. No questions. Yes, just recently come back from Copenhagen and met with uh, European and uh, North American farmers from Canada and Mexico. Uh, and I was kind of blown away by the discussion that we heard from the Europeans there. I mean, they're, they are scared to death as farmers. There was about 300 of them. They're scared to death as farmers that every tool that they have in the tool box in technology is slowly but surely being taken away from them uh, by the general public's opinion of the bad, uh, bad science that's in their food production. So we spent a lot of time, Sarah's here that works on uh, uh, industry relations for us, and we talk to a lot of uh, food companies here in, in America that try to get into their boardrooms. We even buy stock some of their uh, companies so that we can sit in the boardroom and talk to them about uh, the farmers' uh, viewpoint on the issues that they face. Because everything they decide to do that's not based on sound science that comes back to the farm makes it drives us further away from using that science and back toward what I our fathers and grandfathers did, and if everybody knew what how they farmed, they wouldn't want us to go back there. So how do we how do we approach that problem, not just here in America, but across the world, to uh, be able to shape policy or shape opinion of people that they might accept it? And Congressman, you're right. My my wife is sick, and I don't care what technology they throw at her. If they can heal her, I want it today, not ten years from now. But you're exactly right. And our phone. People accept that in this technology. So farmers are really disturbed about the opinion that's coming from the public here in America and especially from Europe. I would add a little bit to that. I think we're at a crossroads right now with CRISPR technologies for modification of both plants and animals. Uh, the, it looks like the decision has been made in, in uh, Europe to follow the, uh, the old approach of GMO regulation. Uh, there are other countries that have declared that it's not that and are making rapid progress right now and they're going to outpace us and in this country we're having a, a debate that's primarily between the uh, the USDA and uh, the FDA. Um, I hope we come out on the right side of this because again we understand the science of this technology but if we get this if we get this one wrong like Europe has already gotten it wrong um, we're going to be in the same boat they are. Uh, we're going to be losing out to China and Brazil and others that are more um, uh, friendly to these new technologies that, once they are proven safe, uh, they are adopted very, very quickly. So, just to follow up, um, we're, you know, you, I think uh, under crop side, FDA, USDA have a, very, have a great policy on genome editing. EPA hasn't formally announced its policy yet, but they have given some uh, talks about it, and they've indicated their plan is to to, uh, to regulate genome editing as a GMO, this, uh, just because they can. But the comment I was going to say is that one of my observations over the years is that public perception tends to follow the strength of the regulations. You know, some prudent regulations proportional to risk, I think, might reassure people. Once you go over the top, people start to question, this must really be bad if you require such stringent uh, regulations. 
Uh, yes, Dr. Hang. Uh, obviously, a lot of the, the progress and a lot of the discussion in the last 30 years has been about plant breeding, GMOs, and that's where a lot of the subject is. <coughs> too. But uh, you also alluded to the importance of fertilizers and your background in soil science, ISDC. I'd like for you to comment on the need for soil fertility and soil fertilizers as opposed to organic production. No, well, it doesn't matter. You, 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 you required nutrients to grow plants. Um, that can come from organic or inorganic sources, but unfortunately, organic fertilizers come primarily from animals, and the estimates are that we would need to increase the number of animals on this planet tenfold to have enough organic manure to fertilize all of our crops, and there are many, many other negative consequences that would come along with that. So, uh, at least for the short term and until maybe there's some other genetic solutions, we are going to be uh, utilizing fertilizers to supply the nutrients for food. In Africa, uh, the, the average African farmer uses only 15 percent of the needed fertilizer to produce uh, an average crop. So their crop yields are only about 15 to 20 percent of what you would find if fertilizers were adequately adequately supplied. And the um, conundrum here is that phosphorus, for instance, most of the phosphorus on this planet is found on the continent of Africa. So that goes back to many of these policy issues. We are constrained by policies for GMO and CRISPR technologies, uh, but we're also constrained by uh, policies that relate to much of agriculture. I'll give you one more example. It's a fertilizer example in the country of uh, in Madagascar. They have a large ammonium sulfate, uh, large ammonium sulfate production. It's a byproduct of some other industry, but it's a great fertilizer. Uh, but it's cheaper to put that ammonium sulfate onto a boat, ship it to China, take it a thousand miles inland and apply it to a field, than it is in the country of Madagascar to truck it a hundred miles inland. And that's because of the regulation of that country and how they manage these inputs. So, Great opportunities um, to make some significant progress with relatively simple technologies. Fertilizers are a very simple technology. Let me just add, yes, they pollute the environment. Uh, when they are misused, hypoxia in the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, the Chesapeake Bay, where I spent most of my life working, polluted there from uh, fertilize, ultimately from fertilizers. So they have to be used appropriately. We have much better knowledge today of how to use fertilizers appropriately, how to get more efficient use out of them, and how to produce the environment less. So a lot of that came, by the way, from government regulation. The regulations used in the right way at the right time are essential and, um, I would argue, has allowed American agriculture to, be, to prosper in spite of or despite, despite it or because of it, whatever you might say. But um, these regulations often very um, negative consequences in Africa and Asia. Uh, in this country, as much as we complain about our regulation, many of them have been uh, quite helpful and have um, allowed us all to have better lives as a result. Thank you. Um, we have three minutes left, so one quick question, and then we have the final remarks. How did you write it? <laughs> uh, so, so Bird doesn't all talk about something that's very critical for us right now, as far as our producers, and that's what he plays with life. Because uh, we have an American agriculture right now. So, I'd like to sort of hear, uh, and maybe do some for for time, maybe maybe some terms of death to the end. But we spend a lot of time in agriculture thinking about the agronomic and diseases and, and all of those things. But where can our solutions then come from to help us uh, basically take the labor out of our farms right now? I know that uh, I have a friend that, uh, that has been waiting on labor from Mexico and he's got 257 uh, people in a hotel right now and he can't get labor if he has to be hand labor. And, and I know that my guys are struggling to get uh, even somebody to let us depend on top of the tractor. So, uh, what are our other options to maybe take the labor issue out of the farm? 
I just want to provide one quick answer before the congressman would answer that. In, in a short and midterm, this is a political decision where we need our elected officials to help with that. In the long term, I think machines are the answer. Uh, uh, the the um, technology of robotics is moving forward so quickly that I think sooner rather than later, much of our labor problem on the farm and in the processing area will be solved through that technology. But that doesn't help us in the short term. Uh, the, the labor issue is a really, really sharp issue, uh, particularly as it intersects with uh, immigration and the whole immigration issue. Uh, it's one with which Congress is wrestling right now. Uh, we expect uh, at some point to have uh, uh, a guest worker uh, bill to come to the floor to at least be considered in committee. Uh, we've been wrestling with this issue now for almost a decade and uh, have not been able to resolve it because we've got uh, so many uh, extreme positions and people who are unwilling uh, to find some middle ground. Uh, in order for us to continue uh, to produce the highest quality, the safest, most economical food and fiber anywhere in the world, We've got to have labor to harvest it, or we won't have producers who will invest in producing it, which means that we won't have the quality of life that we have in this country and be able to help other countries around the world. So we have got to have the will uh, to find middle ground. Uh, the left and the right, uh, the extreme left and right, have got to find a way to come to the middle and resolve it with a consensus. So I, I would tell you that uh, Congressman Bishop and I could probably come up with a pretty quick solution, <laughs> as most of the people in this room could. Unfortunately, with their, their 435 members of the House, there are 100 members of the Senate, uh, there's, there are more emotions than facts in, involved in this, in this resolution. And it is, um, I do not expect anything to happen uh, prior to the next presidential election with regard to uh, immigration. With regard to technology, if something has a hull, uh, it's pretty easy to find a way to pick it with a machine if, if it has a hull. It, when you have um, fruits and vegetables like tomatoes, for example, it becomes becomes much more difficult to, to harvest it without damaging uh, the, the end product. But, but I do, as as the Dean has said, that technology is, is being developed, but I do think that you will have a significant amount of losses of, of the crop with the, the gathering of, from a machine of, of what I would call fragile uh, vegetables and fruits versus, uh, versus the hand. <coughs> but uh, I know we, we could talk for weeks on that one. But that's I just want to make one comment. Labor is also an issue worldwide. In the countries that we work with, um, I've been out in the field with farmers and there are kids, and I haven't met one child of a farmer in Africa that really wants to farm like his dad is farming. And that's scary, uh, because who's going to produce what little food that Africa can actually produce already without creating even more of a crisis? And I know it's a high priority for youth and gender, because there's also a very strong gender dimension for, for labor in Africa, because many crops are grown by women. And I know many innovation labs, our own peanut innovation lab, we have a number of projects looking at what we call time poverty. Uh, what do people do in a, in a day, and what can they do if they're doing agriculture and other technologies? And so I think it's going to be a really important problem globally and not just in the United States. Uh, we, yes, we could talk the whole week about these. It's been fascinating. It covered much more than I expected. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, let's give a hand of applause for our...